Okay. Thank you very much for being here tonight. It's a pleasure to meet you all in person probably very soon. But first, I'm going to speak about something that probably a lot of you are aware what's going on. But some of the trends sometimes are a bit worrying. So my name is Miranda Kaitazi. I have a PhD in information systems with a background in computer science, but then I moved on to strategic computer science, which actually leads us to understand more what information systems are. And from that point on, I actually moved on further and said, I'm going to be focused on security and privacy, particularly, because I know that what's coming up with the big data world and the data-driven societies, uh, we are soon experiencing a data apocalypse in terms of our own privacy. I work uh, as an assistant professor at Lund University at the Faculty of Economics and Management at particularly the Department of Informatics. And this is where I conduct research in the area of security and privacy in particular. So this is where I would like to begin. The hack apocalypse. We know, I mean, we have heard about these trends all the time. We know about these figures, we read on for it on the news. And so the, the, the numbers are progressively expanding. So if we had about $3 trillion invested in 2015 only on cybersecurity matters, that number is doubling by 2021. So in a year from now, we know how much we're trying to invest on something so delicate, yet we can't get a grasp of it, right? We're still so much obsessed with all of these happenings, like damage and destruction of data, stolen money, theft of intellectual property, and on and on. Just today, Google sent me an alert saying that, hey, four of your online profiles are currently under investigation, but because we feel that uh, these passwords related to these profiles are going to be compromised soon. So your first action as one of the users of these um, applications is to go immediately change your passwords. So instead of me trying to crisp my presentation today, I was going on through these four applications trying to change my passwords, complicate the matter more, and then um, do the authentication in a way that complicates the story for the hack apocalypse to actually take over my profiles. Moving on from that, the cybersecurity market reports that the global spendings on cybersecurity products and services will exceed $1 trillion cumulatively over the next five years. So again, the, the, these trends really tell us that we are much more focusing right now on how important it is to take care of security and privacy than we were, well, this is just the beginning of a new decade. So let's say two decades ago, so 2000 to 2010, it was all about bringing things out and telling the world that we are the greatest users until we said, hey, wait a second. Yes, we are the greatest users, but with that, a lot of prices has come. So we will see what, why do I think like that? So exactly right now, a, a colleague of mine who happens to be in the UK, another colleague of mine who happens to be here at Lund University, have joined forces in trying to understand this particular phenomenon, which of course is nothing new, right? We, we clearly see this picture. The more free services that are coming, which is in thousands right now, right? I already said to you, four of my online profiles one from, so I can disclose even more, one from booking.com, one from airbnb.com, one was from Facebook, a closed account already. And the fourth one, I don't clearly remember now, but Emprezi actually, Emprezi was the fourth one, was going to be compromised. And just me being a security and privacy concerned scientist, having all these profiles, and I can tell you how many more I have, tells you exactly this particular trend, how much free services are out there. All of these I mentioned already are free services. Then whether inside these services you want to pay more things, that, that depends on you, such as do you want to use this application called Prezi as an advanced version, then you pay an annual fee. But in general, the service itself comes with no charge, 
So that's why I'm, I'm a user of these free services. And the more I'm doing that, we see that the more I'm losing my privacy. Because each of these profiles shows that you are giving a bit of yourself in different ways. And we'll see, see a very recent study that actually captures that in a very interesting way. But before that, some of these services that I used to be very fond of, and right now, I have not exactly deleted them forever. Luckily, with the GDPR, a lot of hassle has been going on around these applications, and it's made them give me an option as a user to actually delete these profiles forever. But what happens is that I know for sure that all of these postings that I've had before are recorded somewhere. There is companies who are doing that. And they say, oh, I found a photo of yours from 2010 and I'm going, I'm freaking out saying, no, but I have no profiles online. And they say, oh, but I started to collect this data in 2015 when your account was still online. So I don't care that you have deleted it in 2019. My right says that I can collect it from to up to that point when it was online. So it's your fault that you actually began to share it. Anyways, here's Chiara, a very famous person. She's actually the most well-known influencer in the world right now. I mean, she lives a dream life probably just by being an influencer. Why I'm bothered with her profile is because I know too much of her son, Leo. Well, Leo is no longer a baby, but she keeps that there. Leo, as you can see, is growing up. And if I go further into her profile, I know much more about Leo, a stranger to me, and I'm a stranger to him, than I think I should. Because I know, as a scientist in this particular area, how risky business it is for a child to be exposed to this level of detail. In particular, actually, if you are one of these famous figures, which you could be traced easily, as Kiara does. Well, I guess this is her job, so she would do some trade-offs and expose her son Leo to this detail. Moving on from that... We have famous accounts like Twitter, which I also used to be a user. So uh, it's, it's a slightly different platform. Of course, it has a different concept behind it compared to Instagram or Facebook or some others. But in essence, it has that same values, which is the more the free services, the more the loss of privacy, because it does expose another side of me. So what it does is that together with all these other bits of information that I'm sharing, I am completing sort of my digital profile in a way that interests some others that I am not even aware of, right? It just happens. Going even deeper into that, so Twitter said, you know, almost in a jokingly way that they, you know, there is a guy who had private DMs with somebody named Jane and that they were going to expose that, right? And she wasn't happy about that. So it is maybe one instance that Twitter allows, allows such events to happen, but she was really, really not fond of what was going on. And not just that, think of this particular Joshua Tree House that I would like to go and uh, spend uh, a long weekend perhaps. Well, if we actually go into a bit more details, we know that the persons who are owning this place are called Sarah and Rich. And first sight, what we also can see is that people who perhaps maybe are vegan are not so fond of these places. So you're already kind of trying to distance yourself a little bit from who are actually Sarah and Rich. So they might lose a specific market if they're not a bit more specific or careful in how they treat the rest of the society because people believe in different things. So if you are fond of hunting or not caring about the, the climate crisis right now, I mean, these symbols can be attached to who you are as a person. Unfortunately, it is true because it, it kind of discloses who you are. And this is what also scientists are disclosing. So 
you can really show a lot without you maybe intentionally meaning to do so, but it happens. Uh, so uh, you can only guess. Yeah, I guess it's uh, like a bull or um, something. <laughs> so I, I haven't uh, really figured it out, but I know that there is some relationships to that and how we see the world progressing towards a catastrophic end as we, as we know it right now. We have Greta Thunberg telling us a lot about it with a strong voice. And I think she is great and on spot for that to, 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 to happen. I hope she wins the Nobel Peace Prize <laughs> next year. Moving on to the actual study, which is very recent, and it picks in this innovative way what's happening with these ways of how we share ourselves and how we create our digital self that sometimes we're not aware of. They, they do some groupings and you can follow. So if you follow the, the, the black color, you can see what's really going on. So if we are on a personal level sharing things, you, you can use WhatsApp, you can use Viber and related applications. And they normally will tell you, like Viber, for instance, that all the conversations are only stored locally. And even if they would be stored on their own databases, you have to kind of feel safe that they will not be stored for the purpose of being traced later on. Right, so no FBI are going to go and track what you have talked until we always hear that, hey, they've ha the, the, the person who killed that person have had this chat and the actual message is displayed and so on and so on. We know that it's happening. So they can tell us whatever, but we know that in reality, if someone wants access, especially if, if it's an official someone, they're going to get access no matter what. So that story, like stored only personally on your phone and so on, it's, it's not really the case because we, we, we've seen it. It's nothing uh, that we, we don't know. It has happened. The news always even posts these uh, things once they come public. Then we have applications which really are totally public, Airbnb. So you're going to show your rooms to that detail? You're going to show it and it's going to be public. So without even a profile, I can go on Airbnb and search whatever place I want to go and know exactly how that looks. So there it goes. We have had cases where people have spotted cameras where they're placed and uh, uh, very creepy things going on. So yeah, it, it really, it really exposes you in total. Then you have applications which are called peripheral, circular emails. I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but you're working for an organization for your company and suddenly you write an email maybe to two people. You wrote something in that message that maybe one of the lines is a bit more secretive or more personal than the rest. Suddenly one of these people sends it over to another three people and then that another three people from those other three, maybe one takes it even further. So that forwarded email becomes a long one, yours in the last, with that one line that maybe wasn't supposed to happen after all. So it went down to 100 people all of a sudden. But it happens. It happens all the time. And these scientists have actually investigated such emails. So they've got access and have seen that it is a frequent happening. It's not just it happened once. It happens all the time. And people are really not happy with that. And of course, those that are called social networks, right? So they're sort of personal and then they're expanding towards the public. And you can tell why, because we've had the times when you registered on Facebook and by default settings, Facebook profiles were only set onto public until there was a time when GDPR was taking place. And of course, then we said to Facebook, look guys, this is not gonna work well. You cannot treat people because not all of their billion users are aware of how to treat their digital self online. So not everybody will be concerned in terms of security and privacy the way maybe we would do, right? We have elderly people who have just started to use technology. We have very young children whose parents maybe are not so fond of technology either, so they wouldn't know how to actually teach them how to use this technology. So there is target groups that are very risky business if we don't 
make it work in a way that Facebook does not expose them without their knowledge. So of course, with some force and some pressure, things have changed for good on Facebook to some point. What's interesting though, is that once we're doing analysis of these kind of happenings, uh, we target particularly an era that begins in the 1990s. And this is because the 1990s really sets up the atmosphere for uh, all these upcoming new fields that tackle technology. We have HCI, or human-computer interaction. We have information systems that actually, pre prior to that, were mostly called computer-based systems which, or processing systems, which moved on to be called information systems. So really, it's, it's the grounds of what we see now today evolving in terms of technology. And the red part, this is where something very interesting happens. This is what we discovered. But we begin here. So the 1990s is the time when organizations take on these information systems. And um, they mostly call these e-records. So the studies here, so this is the scientific perspective. This is more from a business perspective. This is what they were doing, right? So for instance, marketing as we know it today, Imagine how it worked in the 90s, just two to three decades ago, if we, um, uh, the beginning of the three decades ago. So in the 90s, it was mail delivered to people targeting certain families, targeting, actually it didn't happen by targeting, and that is how they wanted to do marketing of different products. This is the beginning of that. And what happened is that there was once, um, a white collar person saying to the company, hey, can you please stop sending me these pamphlets? Because I am really not interested in diapers. I have not, I don't have a baby at home. I actually have uh, kids going to the university. So this is how marketing functioned at that time. Not only that, this time is also the time when in organizations, uh, you could take a snapshot of employees sitting at their desks so that it could be shared with the rest of the company telling them whether that particular employee is at their desk or not. So that maybe you don't have to walk two blocks if the company was distributed in that nature to actually meet that person if you saw that the snapshot shows that the person is not there. Now imagine how much tracing we do in companies. You can know exactly every second where a person is if you want to. It's that easy and how it was in the 90s. Well, moving on around here from an econ economic perspective, we call this uh, like a breaking point. We call this the dot-com bubble. It was a lot of financial crisis going on and it was a time that the technology that developed up to that point didn't seem to do something exciting, something new, something different. So it was a time when this new economic order appears and it made some of those uh, fanatics of technology to really bring something new and different. Otherwise, you know, it's like um, try to exist in a different way or perish, basically it was that. So that breakdown point changed that sphere for us. And do you know which one of the companies is the one that actually set up the scene for us, what's coming next. I think a lot of us are big time users of this particular company. Which one is that? Google. Yes, of course, it's Google. Google brings the most exciting search engine that we still use today. Of course, a lot of us are concerned about how it's processing our data. So maybe we have users of DuckDuckGo here in the room, yeah, a couple of good users, yeah. And this trend, if I've asked, and I actually have asked this question maybe three, four years ago, uh, people have asked me, can you please explain what DuckDuckGo is? Because they had no clue that it even existed. But the trends are changing and that is because today, speaking of security and privacy, is a complete different understanding on how we spoke of it yesterday, basically. 
So what's going on here, as they set this, they are the ones who knew how to collect data. And data that was so scattered that they were also the, one of the first to make sure that they knew how to manage that in a way that today we talk about data science and data analytics. Because it changed the way on how we actually do marketing, right? No longer this white color man is receiving diaper marketing images. Of course, they're receiving personalized marketing services and personalized everything. It's not just that. Um, just a very simple example. I bet everyone here have tried eating M&M's chocolate, little M&M chocolates. So what M&M has done just recently is that they have launched a new service called My M&M. Have anyone tried this? No. So what you can do is actually go to mymnm.com and order a box of these simple chocolates that everyone had access to, at least at, at a part of a, of a life, and maybe even today. I still eat them sometimes. <laughs> and, and, and personalize them to the point that I can put a picture of my son, uh, his birth date, his favorite color or flag, and share it with all of uh, the kids invited to his birthday party. So really personalize it to that level. So what happens then is that M&M knows how crazy I am about that particular birthday of my son. And of course, they're going to feed me with much more marketing later on. So I become a, that typical consumer of their chocolate of 100 grams, which in price is about tenfold, just because those pictures are put on those little M&Ms. So that kind of personalized services are really telling us how the world economy is changing. And with that, now we hear how damaging it is when something like a new health alert, like the coronavirus that originated in China, changes this, right? Now everybody's concerned suddenly about the economy failing and not, I mean, I shouldn't say not caring about the number of increased deaths that is happening, but rather saying that, oh my God, the losses are in the economy sector. Because M&M doesn't want to lose that niche, that customer niche where uh, they're putting a tenfold price on that small pack. Further on, so of course, setting up the scene, so it started with Google, but around 2010, we have much more than just Facebook appearing. Right? Facebook is just behind Google. So it begins there, but it's still not trending that much. And that's why this particular end of the decade marks the, the flourishment of social media. Because much more than Facebook comes in here. And of course, if we speak of Facebook, we should not forget that we had so much more applications, like High Five. Has anyone ever used High Five before Facebook appeared? So it, it, it had a trend. There were users. Suddenly, uh, we registered its death, and then Facebook, which is still strong and living. And of course, strong and living because it has the power to buy things like Instagram. It's one, one of its greatest competitors because it's, it's, it's changing the way it's, it is also doing business. And, and here, I mean, you can see what's going on here, the trend. So this is the time when everybody's talking about big data analytics. And why? Is because I told you, all of my exposure as a person in all of these different applications shows a lot what I'm sharing, but someone has to connect the dots. And to do those dots, scientists bring in, together with the business, new concepts on how we target these. Because they want to perfectionate marketing even more, so they know that when I'm talking to my sister, that I might visit her early March in Stockholm, and at the same time, maybe she's renovating her home, there is this technology behind, probably AI, that is learning very well that I will not have a chance to stay at my sister's because she's renovating, so I probably need a hotel room. They can, I mean, they're very clever in how they design this technology to actually know when would I need this hotel room in Stockholm and when I wouldn't. So not, not every time they actually send me the, the uh, 
the trending hotels that uh, would buy, um, yeah, would maybe buy their services. But they knew that she was renovating, and there probably wasn't enough space for me. Hmm. I was very surprised with that. And of course, not just Internet of Things. So we heard around these years that the Internet of Things is happening. There is this smart refrigerator at our homes nowadays. And from that, we moved to smart homes and smart cities. We already put up panels on counting how many bikers there are per day. And we have already heard from those technologies that right now they're very primitive. So who cares about how many bikers are there, except for the fact that it can influence us in our environmental thinking. But what can we do about it more? And how that digital panel can actually shift with much richer data, which it can. Right? So from that little simple detail, making an environmental impact on our minds, down to making much more than that, really, even producing energy in, in, in the near future. So, so from Internet of Things as a thing to everything. And whew, it's not just Internet of Everything. Now we just started to hear that we're moving on to something even bigger. So one can ask, like, Internet of Everything, wouldn't that be enough? I mean, everything. But because we're seeing this now, like AI-based services coming and learning with deep analytics what we should do next, engineered health. Just now we're hearing that you can cut down the time in producing a vaccine by four times compared to how it was before, just because you can engineer it in a way that you can target this particular new disease like the coronavirus and try to stop it spreading before it becomes something like a pandemic of uh, 2009 with H1N1. So hopefully we're up for that and we don't have to see what happened in 2009. And this is the new trend, so Internet of Senses, right? So it goes even beyond this everything because the everything never defined that we can design AI-based technology that actually listen to our senses and makes decisions based on that. The everything mostly focused still on the things itself, right? Touchable things. The untouchable things or intangible things were not so representative until we hear this or we heard this. What Ericsson is also telling us is that we have to admit, there is no room to say, hey, look, oh, you, you, security and privacy is such an important matter. We have to be worried about it. We have to be the ones who are the who are post-privacy consumerism, right? So we have to accept that there is sort of these sharings and how, how we deal with that is by admitting that there is regulations like GDPR and related regulations that are constantly appearing and trying to enforce new laws to take place that when I actually share something and I'm very aware of sharing it, it will be protected in a way that will not be abused. So this is what they were trying to say. And I, it's, it's just, it's not something that they want to bring. It's something that is happening, so we just have to admit it. And for me, as a scientist in that area, I, I cringe and I'm saying like, oh my God, maybe my, my research will be dead <laughs> because then there will be no space to do research on privacy matters anymore because we just have to go post that. But actually it will be even stronger. Uh, uh, I'm sorry for my irony there, but I had to, to do it because it will be even stronger, stronger. In particular, targeting those vulnerable groups that will still not understand what it takes to make sure that you are sec private enough or secure enough when you're actually exposing yourself. And those target groups, as I said, probably would be for, uh, for, for a while still the elderly and the very young always. But the elderly, once the generations of those um, tech-savvy people comes in, of course, we know that they would know a lot. But the youngs, younger generations, we are always fearing for them. And it will keep 
uh, on growing as a fear. Yeah. So where all of this comes from, uh, I'm not sure if you've heard of a very famous scientist called Shoshana Zuboff. She uh, works, or at least worked at MIT. I'm not sure if she's retired right now. But she, she coined this term called surveillance capitalism. And her concern with one of the latest books that came in 2019 is that we have to break this trend. Being surveilled all the time, it's not a good thing. And it's all related to what I have already spoken. But scientists following in her footsteps, just like Ericsson, say that, you know, a future without secrets is here to stay. We just need to learn or relearn on how to cope with that. So relearning takes European Commission or European Union to actually enforce the development of these new regulations like GDPR. So that's the only way we can target it for now. Otherwise, without these regulations, uh, we, we, we keep letting Google really read my private DMs with my sister when I'm going to Stockholm and they knowing what am I going to do there. Right. Right. So this particular statement comes from Alessandro Acquisti. He's a very famous scientist who is actually now targeting privacy-based matters mostly. But he also, of course, distinguishes privacy itself from secrecy. So yes, yeah, secrets. What kind of secrets are we speaking? So if we start detaching the concept of secrets, we can talk about secrets that maybe shouldn't be held, such as, um, well, people in China right now are trying to hide if they have symptoms. And th for the good of the society, they should not. They're being forced out of the apartments. And we have seen these videos, and we all think that this is against human rights. But then we have to think that they should admit that this is for the betterment of the society. So what are we talking here, right? So it's a very, very delicate thing. We are at the edge. What is right or wrong? But moving on with, with the secrets, really, or not just the secrets, is the private life of yours, not only anymore on the digital self, because we have always heard that we have the two selves, the digital self, what we've created with our profiles, and the physical self. And of course, the, the companies, what they're trying to do is bring these two together, merge them, so the, the digital and the physical are moving along together. So you don't have to be so detached from it, like the sharing economy. We are hearing this new tram com coming, really, the peer-to-peer -peer car sharing, the, the, one of these sharing services. So you already are telling these companies so where you're going, with whom you're sharing the cars, maybe even what you're speaking while you're on that ride, because, frankly speaking, do we actually know that they can't trace you? I mean, they might even tell you, hey, we need to record you all the time for the safety reasons liability reasons. So you decide whether you want to opt in or opt out. So these are services that we have to be cautious about and know that, yeah, it can happen. But then is this question with Ericsson and Acquisti, do we really need any secrecy or privacy? Or are, is privacy really dead? So just hop along and maybe it's going to be fine, whatever they're going to share. One of the latest trends with the technology, such as the Amazon technology and Google as well, is those very famous speakers that maybe a lot of you own at home right now, like Sonos speakers. Anybody has them? Yeah. So it happened that, well, in Sweden, we still don't have that service to connect it to your phone and actually it can listen to you. I have them as well and often I just, without really asking for it to talk to me, it boom, makes the noise, being alert, listening, as if I called it to ask something. And I didn't, but it mishears a word as if I'm saying, hey, Google, because I've used, I first used Amazon, Alexa, and then I moved on to Google because it felt safer than Amazon. I'm not sure about it. 
<laughs> it felt a bit safer. But I'm, as I'm saying, I'm not sure about it. And I unplug them most of the time. And I make my partner crazy about that. It's like, oh my God, again, unplugged. Anyway, so what happened is that uh, Alexa, Amazon's Alexa, there was one occasion when there was a couple who didn't hear that it, it beeped and that it was listening. It recorded a conversation. And during the conversation, Alexa, as if it heard that it said, send this conversation to John. And it sent the whole conversation to John. And John then came to this couple and said, hey guys, did you mean to send this conversation to me? And they said, no, we never meant to do that. So it became a big buzz about, wow, look at uh, the privacy with Alexa. Guys, this is very unsafe. Uh, and not only that, it, it could... Um, so suddenly start in the middle of the night and freak people out with uh, very creepy voices. And uh, yeah, this is really what we're doing right now. Either opt-in or opt-out. I mean, it's, it's your choice. Do you want to follow the technology and make your life easier because Alexa can turn on your lights if that's too hard to do? Or whatever, tell, tell the weather because you're on the move, you're doing something. We, we are living a life which is uh, about multitasking. And of course, for me, instead of taking this phone with my hands making salad and making it dirty, I could just ask, actually, Alexa or Google and tell me about weather if I just wanted to know in that second. So uh, this on-demand information, it's the one that is building me. And if, as if it is extremely important that I need that on-demand information now, and yeah, these technologies, these services are making it easier for me to do so. And further on, very soon closing with this, is that you probably have seen this. Yeah, I'm just trying to, to tell that yes, even big names out there are a bit concerned that um, Facebook maybe is not the right channel anymore because of the way of how they're treating us. But, I mean, the story of Facebook is already almost outdated. We know about it, yes, and we have opted in or opted out on our own choices. But companies like Clearview, they're telling us, look, this I'm only collecting public information, only, and I'm only doing search on you, not surveillance, and I'm trying to stop criminals and I'm doing all these things, but I can actually fetch you out in every single picture that has been put publicly out from you. And if I tell them, hey, but look, I have deleted my Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, I only keep LinkedIn, they will still say, I'm sorry, but I collected this in 2018 when you still had them on, or 15 if you, when you still had them on, the story I told you earlier. So. If, if we know about these companies and those that we don't right now, this is the risky part, right? How many AI-generated services are out there that have collected trillions of data? And not just Clearview, who are really on a bright white mission. What about those black missions that we are not so sure what's going on? Yes. And... I guess to end my speech from the scientific perspective down to the business perspective and the actual personal perspective if to ha is to actually close it with this new mantra. So live a completely open and transparent life without secrets, but, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> okay. Yes, I don't want to tell anyone. Yes, thank you very much. If you have any questions, or if you want to um, chat during the pizza time, or even later, we can keep on doing that. Yes? Thank you so much. I mean, Google keeps everything. Like, literally everything. You can't... <laughs> undo anything there. And uh, as I said, I mean, even if you close these profiles later on, they will still have those, pro th those things that you have had before. 
it was there. When it was public, it was public. Or even if it's private, they're going to keep a database. Yeah, they have all the searches. All, all the searches. So I, I tell you a story. There was a very famous uh, criminal writer, like no, novelist, um, in the U.S., who has been having ideas about writing a new uh, novel about some criminal activities. And one of those activities involves uh, killing a wife, right? So what happens is that Google, of course, with its AI machines, is tracing all the time these conversations or these searches. I mean, we hear every day about the trends of what was the most searched word of the day even, not just of the year of, or of the dec decade. So they really collect everything and they know they can, they have pointers to every single individual who has done that. So what happened with this individual is that in a matter of hours, the FBI was at his door. And he was confused, like, what's happening? And when the door actually was opened, there was a woman, a young woman with a baby on her hand. And the FBI was like, thank God, we caught the person before killing his wife. And when he came at the door, he was totally in shock and confused. Like, what's, what's this? They said, we are tracing you because you were searching how to kill your wife. Uh, I mean, so the whole point with his search was, as I said, he was a novelist and no intentions to actually killing his wife. But yeah, so Google d does know what we're searching. And that's why a lot of uh, people, and this new trend I'm seeing is very recent, but have moved on to safer uh, search engines rather than just Google. I'm not familiar with it. No. Anybody, maybe? Yes? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes? Not particularly which one is that or where is it located? Because there is a lot of these centers around the world. I mean, even a small department sometimes yeah, builds these. Okay. Yeah, yeah, very, very known thing. Yes, yeah, so I think there's a lot of scientific groups and even organizations who are on the mission to try to, to declutter the web from unnecessary things, like stress-related things and so on. We've heard a lot about social media in particular, how much more damage it does than good. So th there's a lot of us who are on, on a mission to do just that, but it is extremely hard to break the path right, to, to move into another course. It's extremely hard to do that now. So I'm thinking also about the, the trend that uh, the new camps in college create. I'm really, really interested in that because, I mean, like you, I also see a lot of good, like, like you said, older and children, but also like young, young people or people who, for some reason, have been out of society. When they come back in, they, they, don't, they don't know. Like I had a I was at a conference just recently when there was a scientist speaking exactly of this event and you, you would be perplexed just hearing real-time data that he showed on how many people actually still click exactly on these emails of winning lotteries, which is so... So for us, out of our minds, because we know what it is, but knowing or seeing the facts that it is actually still happening, you, you just can't believe it. But it does, because... What we lack in the world is awareness. And to raise awareness in, t in terms of making everybody know what it takes to be there out in the outer world from a digital point of view 
it, it is not easy to do because not everybody understands the consequences in the same way. So yeah, thanks for making that point. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. First. Because we would just let it be. Mm. You're make, or raising an important question here. We as scientists, when we when we tackle this way of you know your personal self being exposed to the world, we always kind of put a mark or circle China because that's another way of looking at how they trace people by pressure. Yeah. While Google doesn't doesn't say does it openly or, or it only says hey I'm reading it for the sake of yours yes I completely understand that but we we can take our example in Sweden uh, until just recently the whole the belief within the Swedish society was that people are very concerned about being surveilled in whatever means until there was a public poll out asking Swedish people. Would you be willing to be surveilled publicly for the sake of your security? Nine out of ten Swedish people said, I desperately want more surveillance. So people, them, so you see, you make a trade-off here. You have a concern that a lot of your personal self is being exposed without often your knowledge. Now, I mean, now we know a lot, but we haven't targeted the whole society especially the very young who were not sure how to target them. There is educational lessons at schools and so on and so on. But they're often more concerned about that exposure rather than that concerning... Yes? Because of safety reasons. So safety and security became a priority over their personal self. Anyways. <laughs> so I think we're made aware. Essentially, there is a disconnection, I think, between cost and what you gain. Because, mm. yes, it's a free service, but of course, uh, all these companies want to know how they can be made aware of that. Because you always go to the biggest disconnect when someone is becoming on your service. So it is wrong that now you want to be also inspected and so on. That's why, yeah, thank you very much for, for raising that or alerting that part because that's why we have gathered as a team and are looking into this free service and the loss of privacy as a dichotomy. And <coughs> that when, when you have more free services, there is more loss of privacy, which is often not looked into that perpendicular view. Often we don't see it because that perpendicular view actually shows how it's expanding. 
and people tend to oversee that or overlook that. Hmm? Yes? Yes. Yes, we, we, yeah. Yes, it depends on the audience. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.